This is the Everything Real Estate Investing Show with Sean Pan, where we interview local real estate investors and professionals to go over tips, tricks, and investing strategies to help you learn about the business and to enable you to achieve your financial goals. And now, welcome to the show. What's going on, everyone? And welcome to episode 234 of the Everything Real Estate Investing Show with Sean Pan. Today, we have Danny Johnson. Danny is a real estate investor and host of the Flipping Junkie podcast. Danny has been flipping houses, wholesaling, and renting properties since 2003, and has done nearly 1,000 deals during that time. He's the founder of Lead Propeller, which is a real estate investing website creator, as well as Forefront, a real estate investor CRM. In this episode, we'll be talking about Danny's origin story and how he got started investing in properties while working a busy full-time job. We'll also be talking about the inbound marketing strategies that he uses to get qualified seller leads and how to find good contractors to use for your flips. So if you want to learn how to get leads and create a great real estate investing team, then you need to listen to this episode. And by the way, this real estate market is still incredibly hot. So if you're looking for a hard money loan for your fix and flip projects, or if you're looking for a 30-year fixed loan for your rental properties with rates as low as 4%, then you can contact me at sean at everythingrei.com. That's S E A N at everythingrei.com. Let me know that you're a podcast listener and I'll get you a discount on our processing fees. And now, on to the show. Danny, thank you so much for being on the show today. Go ahead and introduce yourself and let us know who you are and tell us what you do. Yeah, thanks, Sean. So Danny Johnson and been a real estate investor since 2003. And before that, I was a software developer. So I also have been, during that time, developing software and you know for real estate investors in the same market because I found the need in my own business uh, for lead management and follow up and things like that that I wasn't doing for so long, and uh, so I've been creating software for that. I'm also the founder of uh, Lead Propeller websites and um, Forefront CRM is the the CRM system that we've built. Um, but but with the real estate investing, you know, I got started because I was working as a software developer right out of college, and you know, my dad had started flipping houses. He he was a contractor while I was growing up for a house flipper um, in San Antonio. And so I got to go to the demo. Like I had to help him do demo on a lot of houses and how messy that was. And I think that's why I became a, a software developer. It's like, I don't want to do, I don't want to do that work. I just didn't want to, like it was hot. It's hot here, right? Like to be in houses without AC and, and you know, shoveling debris and stuff like that is not fun. Um, and And so after college, my dad started, working with that investor, he was showing him how to, how to do the business and started showing him how to flip houses. And he was just having a blast. You know, it was like driving around during the day and, uh, you know, going to these rehabs and doing deals and being so excited about the deals that he was doing. And at that moment, I realized like, I, that's something that I want to do too. I really am excited about that because I'm sitting in this office all day long and it was like a top secret clearance. So there was, it was called a skiff you know, it was for a defense contractor. And so there was like no windows, all artificial light. And then, you know, it was just kind of miserable and boring. And so just the idea of being able to be driving around town during the day while everybody else is at work, like appealed to me, just something about like that, you know, whole thing. I think I said something the other day where it's kind of like when you're a kid and you're sick home from school and you're like watching TV and you're watching daytime television and you're thinking, you know, your friends are in a certain class and you're like, yeah, I'm just sitting here. Like I'm not there and just like a good feeling. So anyway, um, this is going to be real long if I keep up the same detail. So I'm going to cut it kind of short. But for three years, I I did the business part time while I still worked my software job because I was too scared to not get the paycheck, even though at that point I was losing money because I could make so much more, you know, if I was full time working the house business. So it actually took them firing me to actually go full time. Yeah, that was like in 2006, I think. And uh, I I was really excited about it. My manager actually came to me and he was like, they want me to fire you, but I'm I'm trying to, I'm fighting for you. I'm like, no, don't fight for me, (laughs) man. This is what I need. I need I need to go out and I need to to leave this job and I'm not going to quit on my own. I need you to do it. So I was just scared. I was like, I ah, I don't know. Like it, like doing the business part time felt safe because I knew I always that was like just extra money, right? It wasn't. And then you know I had a deal with a, a mentor where I was getting 
50% of the profits and I was finding the deals and handling all everything and he was putting up the money. So I had no risk, right? I gave up 50% of the profit, but that was completely worth it because I didn't know what I was doing. I mean, it was a good way to learn and then also uh, get into the business. So it took three years, went full time. And my ex-wife and I ran that business for eight or nine years, just me and her. You know, we had an agent to sell properties. We had contractors to do the fix up, but we didn't have anybody else on the team. I was answering the phone calls, doing the marketing, going to the houses and uh, to the appointments, putting them on a contract, setting up the contractor, checking on the jobs and, and all that stuff. It was just a lot of stuff, man. And after so many years, you realize that, well, I realized that, um, I had success in the business and I tried to have more success by just doing more of the same thing and working harder, working longer hours. And, um, you know, I realized at a certain point when, you know, a call would come in and I would take the call from a motivated seller and I, and I would get off the call. And then, you know, my wife at the time would say, you were being kind of rude. And I was like, oh, man, like I didn't realize that it was coming across. But, you know, I'm irritated because I got to take the call. Like, you know, we're on the way and we're having a conversation and here's a call. It could be a great deal and I've got to take this call. And then, you know, the great deals and motivated seller calls at five o'clock on Friday afternoon. And I'm like, you're already set, ready for the weekend, ready to go do something. You know, maybe we're going to go to the lake house or something and, and just like, oh, man, now I got to go to this appointment because if I don't, the competitor's going to get it. You know, and it, it was just, it got to the point where it was, at the very beginning, you know, all those things I would definitely would do, right? But then it got to the point where it was a job and it was work. And uh, so we wanted to transition out of that. But I feel like I've shared the story. We can dig into that more, but I'll let you ask a question. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it's so funny because I feel like we have very similar backgrounds. So I used to work at Boeing in Northrop Grumman. So defense contracting companies, we had the skiff rooms where... You can't even now nowadays. You can't even bring your phone inside, right? You can't play games yeah. on your phone. Well, can't you couldn't then either. <laughs> you could then either, right? Um, back yeah. then, I think you could even you could bring Walkmans, right, with a with a set disc, but not anything that can be rewritable, right? So everyone everyone at our work, they brought books. You know, that's all you could do uh, to, to kill the downtime. And yeah, I felt the same way. Uh, actually, the biggest thing that impacted me was seeing my coworkers, who were thirty years my senior, and just seeing their lifestyle. And seeing like how unhappy they were and how unsatisfied they were with their choices in life. And they said, Sean, when I was your age, I had so many opportunities to do a lot of cool things, but I took the safe route. And then I was like, man, I, I can't be here for 30 plus years. And that's why I started trying real estate investing. Like, I, I'm just wondering, like, how, how did you get fired? Like, was it because of just company wide layoffs or, you know, were you not performing because you're too busy with your you know, real estate career? Yeah, I think that they saw that my, I wasn't passionate about it. They saw that I wasn't, you know, I just wasn't, uh, I wasn't completely bought in. I wasn't giving, like being a part of the team, really. Um, I was doing my work, but the thing was, they would give me a project and I, you know, and told me like two two months to do it or something. I could finish it in a week because I just worked my butt off to finish it. And then, you know, I had time to, to you know, research properties and, and read forums on, on real estate investing and, you um, I mean, that's like one of the ways that I truly learned so much about this business is there was a website called uh, Creative Real Estate Online. It was like CRE Online or something. And you know, that's like dates it, right? Because it was like had online in the name and the web, <laughs> and the, web the, the domain name. But um, there was a guy named Steve Cook. And he was like, he had gotten to a point where he was, his business was doing really good in his house flipping. But he, he had grown from just getting started like two or three years before. And all of his questions, he asked so many questions in, in that forum. And I thought it was fascinating to go back, search his name for all his posts, go back to the earliest ones and read all of them all the way up. Because you got to see as he progressed the different questions that he asked. And, and come to think of it like that, somebody should build a course like that, right? Like based on somebody's real world posting but I, I just was spending a lot of time researching that stuff and i learned so much but they let me go because i wasn't they knew i wasn't there long term i wasn't I yeah wasn't i mean it. you were checked out from the job 
I yeah. felt the same way. Like every day I would go to work. I could finish my job in less than 10 minutes for like a whole day's work. But they they make you like have a time, what time clock? Uh, whatever, time card. So they, you have to sit there for the whole eight or nine hours, right? You take a one hour lunch break, they expect you to work another extra hour. And uh, yeah, I wasn't cutting for me. So I was spending a lot of time researching forums, reading books, and sometimes even going on job sites just because like, I didn't need to be there, right? Um, yeah, it was it was pretty bad. And yeah, mentally, it's not a place you want to be long term if it doesn't fit you. So when you were starting your your real estate investing journey, were you working with your dad? No, I wasn't. And that's uh, that's an interesting thing because you know my mentor was actually his mentor, and he answered questions for me when I had them. But his he he worked. I'm in San Antonio. He's in small town outside of San Antonio, and so most of what he did was all small towns like around and outside of the city. And then I was in the city and it was different. Um, plus he, he just had like a sixth sense about like values. I got access to the MLS so I could run comps and he never did. And I was so curious about, it. I was like, how are you buying all these properties? And you have no, like you, you're not looking up comps. And he's like, I just know what the values are. Like, this is crazy, man. I don't, you know, I guess at the small town, maybe there's not that much variance or something. I don't know, but he, he's done well. With, without ever really kind of running comps, at least in the past, he never did. But so, so it wasn't really, he didn't hold my hand. He was like, you find your own way. You find your own, you know, way of doing whatever you're going to do, if you're going to flip or wholesale or whatever. But, um, but his mentor was my mentor and he was the same way. It was kind of like, go learn the stuff you can learn. Don't ask me basics, right? Don't ask me stuff you can read on a forum you know, that's, that's a waste of their time because it's already, there's plenty of stuff. You can get a $300 course at the time that would cover like all that stuff. Right. So it's more of learn what you can learn. And that, that's for anybody out there, right? If you're using an excuse to get started of, well, I don't have a mentor, you know, I need to find a mentor. I need to do something like that. It's like, no, don't let that be an excuse. You can learn a lot of stuff first. Right. And the thing is, you got to start taking action because they wouldn't have worked with me had I not t- took any action. Like They weren't going to like teach me the basics and then like see me just keep learning. They wanted to handle when I was taking action and I would come across a situation where I needed help. That's that's the relationship. And I think you know, anybody looking to, to partner, mentor with some, get a mentor and, and partner with them, which I think is a great way to get started. Like I said, no risk because they, they've got all the money in the game. And if they've been an investor themselves, they can keep you out of trouble, right? Like if you bring a crappy deal to them, they're going to say, no, you know, you're going to lose money on this deal. So they can kind of help you to not make mistakes. But, and then as you take action, then you've got good questions because you have a relevant. So as an example, and this, this is going to sound funny to anybody that's doing deals or even bought a house really. So I I put my first house under contract from a motivated seller And I remember signing the contract and taking it to the title company. And I was in the parking lot of the title company ready to go in. And I said, oh, no. I was like, of all this stuff that I've learned, I have no idea what I'm supposed to say whenever I go in here with a contract. You know, so in that case, I did call my dad. I was like, what am I supposed to say? Like, who am I even supposed to talk to? (laughs) Like, what is... You know, that that you need to receipt this contract. And so anyway, that's, that's like, that shows you that... You know, if, if you're thinking you need to learn every single step in this business before you can do something, that is not absolutely not true. I went, I got a contract on a house from a seller <laughs> without knowing what I was going to say at the title company when I brought it there. So, I mean, you know, maybe it's not the smartest thing to do, but you don't know what you don't know until you need to know it. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I mean, there's a lot of free information out there, podcasts like this one, YouTube videos, and of course, wonderful forums, including the Bigger Pockets. And you know, you can learn all the basic terminology, you can learn what to do. And I guess it really only makes sense to talk to a mentor if you come across situations. Like for me, um, in the Bay Area here, sometimes we get permits, sometimes we don't. And for me, like, as a new flipper, I had no idea what to do. So luckily, I was you know attending a lot of meetup groups, and I got to know a lot of the more experienced flippers, and kind of ask them, mm-hmm. hey, like for a project here in this area, what do you typically do? And then they're like, you can kind of get away with not getting a permit, you know, like all that kind of information you wouldn't find on a podcast. No one's going to say it out loud. No one's going to write it in a book, but you can ask a friend who does the business in that area and they can just give you a candid answer, like what they do. Yeah, 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 absolutely. 
Yeah, having having those those people to um, that have already been through it, that can really help you because yeah, there's not going to be there's not going to be a training course that's going to tell you in the Bay Area these areas, you know, you can do this or you can do that. Like, there's no no one's ever going to put that together, right? right? Like, so it's really like you like who you know, I guess. Yeah, and so when you were getting started, what was your main source of lead generation? The main so, so I tried MLS and that frustrated me to no end. I was and and that's you know the market was getting pretty hot back then and just like it is now and so the the you know you go and make offers on houses all day long on mls just to be told highest and best there's multiple offers and all that kind of stuff and so i started doing direct marketing to motivated sellers so i started doing driving for dollars and for anybody that thinks that that's too basic and it's not a way to get it like that that's the way i still prefer this to this day to find deals that's not my main source, but I like doing it and it gets you out to see your entire market, right? There's so many places I had never been to in my city because I had no reason to go there and to like drive and explore was really fun. And then you can find contractors while you're doing it. You can find all kinds of cool things. And um, so driving for dollars, bandit signs. And then after a couple of years, I don't know why it took me a couple of years, but I put together a website and then got that ranked. And that became my main source. And to this day, that's really what generates my my leads. And when you say uh, making a website and getting it ranked, is it something like uh, like an a investor forum where we're well, not investor forum, but like buyers or sellers can go to your website and it's yeah. like, oh, buy, I'll buy your house as is. And then they fill in their information and that's how you get their lead. Right. Okay. Yeah. And the reason why I like the, the website leads was because is because the you know, they, they typically they're searching for for somebody to solve a problem that they have where it involves selling a house. Right. Which could be a bunch of different things. But at the end of the day, they already know that they want to sell or get an offer for their house. Right. So which is way different than outbound marketing like direct mail, where you're putting a bunch of stuff out, hoping that some of those people might want that. Whereas if you're attracting them inbound, they already kind of know. You know, I say the same thing even for like the hard money lending business. So, you know, we're in a sales role, right? We're trying to give people loans for their fixed and flip projects. But I found that when I cold call random investors and I say, hey, I saw your project here. Let me know if you have another project and I can fund it for next time. It doesn't usually go that well, right? Because they don't know who I am. They think I'm just a random caller. I'm, I'm probably bothering them on a random busy day. Whereas now I have a podcast, YouTube channel, meetup group. I tell them I do hard money loans. When they have a project, they come to me and, you know, yeah. they have a great time because they're working with me, right? They know me and... Uh, it's so much easier doing business through inbound leads and yeah. you know warm con- contacts versus cold calling, which I yeah, personally yeah. hate a lot. Yeah, it's really beautiful because you, you're building the the credibility and trust and rapport and all that, you know, be, by putting things out there so that people, you know, but when, whenever somebody just calls you out of the blue for something, <laughs> you know, you're gonna be suspicious. You know, just kind of like, well, I don't, I don't know who this. Actually, that that brings up a funny story. I remember one time I was looking at my my stats, my analytics for my website traffic, and I was trying to figure out because I got a big bump. I was like, "Why did I get such a big bump of traffic to my website?" Because um, typically these these seller websites, you know, for for buying houses is not you don't get a ton of traffic. There's not there's not millions of people dying to get an, an offer for their house, you know, from an investor. But um, there was a bump, and I, I looked at where it was coming from. It was coming from a guitar like a bass guitar forum website. And I was like, why are all these people from this bass guitar forum coming to my website? This is so weird. So I, I went and I searched for my website in the forum and there was a post and this guy was saying, I got this letter from this guy and he's wanting to buy my house. Is this a scam? Like, what's the deal with this? And it was so funny to like hear, they, they were just all trying to figure out what the deal was, what I was trying to do, like what, what the whole thing was, whether it was a scam or whether it wasn't. And, you know, somebody posted, oh, he's an attorney. I did a search and he's an attorney and this and I'm not an attorney. (laughs) There's like all kinds of crazy accusations or just like, you know, everybody kind of having their own opinion. And then finally, somebody that's a bass guitar player, but also an investor said that's just common. That's what we all do. We're just looking to make offers on houses. So there's nothing more than that. Don't read anything more than that into it. Yeah, I mean, as an investor myself, like I have properties in like Jacksonville, Florida, and I get calls, maybe five calls a day, random text messages of people wanting to buy my house. Sometimes I take the call just to entertain them, 
But then I find nowadays people don't even call themselves. They outsource that to, you know, virtual assistants, you know, mm-hmm. overseas. And they all have the same script. So it's not even fun talking to them. I can't even say, hey, like, tell me more about your offer. And they're like, oh, we need you to tell me all this information first before we can create an offer for you. And I'm like, this is so sad and a waste of time. So then I just hang up now. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that, that's something to think about, though. I mean, if you're doing that, right, if you're doing that as a prospecting, doing the calling, you know, obviously you're not a motivated seller, though. So your your I, your view of those calls is probably different than somebody that might be motivated. But anyway, considering the fact that, yeah, I mean, if you if you got some training where people said this all worked um, and, you know, and to use it and then everybody's using it. But then it's obvious to people that are on the receiving end of that, that it, it's just something that everybody's using. And it's just weird because all these different people are calling me saying the same thing. And um, that actually gets into something that I, I believe is, is really important for us in this business, because whenever I got into the business, like the creativity of finding deals to me is what fired me up. I loved trying to think of ways to find people that would want to sell. I mean, that was just something that excited me and and allowed me to be creative. And my mentor recently shared a story with me actually about sort of about this where this was like a couple of years ago, we had lunch and he was telling me, he, he said, you know, whenever the home investors franchise started up, um, up in Dallas, he said the the, the owner came down and, and met with him for lunch and wanted him to be one of the first franchisees. And he said he he pushed like all their processes, their notebook, their binder, whatever of all their systems and stuff. Cause it's like McDonald's as a franchise, like you do this and this and all that. He, he showed it to my mentor. My mentor looked at it and then he shoved it back and he said, no, I don't want to do it. And the guy was like, well, why not? And he said, well, where's all, where's the fun in this? Like, you're just telling me to do, you know, it's like, where, where's the creativity? Like, where's the, the fun in, of being an entrepreneur and being in business? If I'm, if I'm doing, and I know there's some freedom, like in their ability to do their own thing within that organization or whatever as a franchisee, but um, the, the, the it's more about the idea though of of really looking at this as being something as a chance for people to create something different, be creative, and think of new ways. Like go ahead and use what other people are showing you works, but then consider what you like to do or what might work, and and focus on that. And and the big thing is you know, for myself and for the biggest investors that I know, they all focus on only a certain couple channels to get deals and they just become the best at those. You know, they're not doing 20 different things and they're sure as heck not switching what they're doing or trying new things every two months. Yeah. Like that, that's just like, I did that for a long time and and that's not the way to go. I mean, you try some things, but then you need to get to a point where you're just really working on making one thing work. Right. Whether that be direct mail, whether that be online, whether that be uh, doing uh, guerrilla marketing tactics. If you're like a driving for dollars beast or something, you know, you like drive your entire city or have, you know, pay drivers to go and do it for you. Um, But you become you, you dial it in like what you do. And what made the biggest shift for me in my business was to really operate it as a true business, as as something that gets measured, like everything that you do needs to be measured. Because if you're not measuring it, if you're not looking at it, you don't know which way you're going. And obviously you, before that even, you kind of need to know where you're going too, right? Like you can't, like I can't go to see you over on the West Coast without, you know, knowing where you are and then heading in that direction, right? Because it's like, I'm going to look for you all over the world. You know, it's not going to, it's not going to happen. So having the direction, what you want your, your business to look like. And, and I think it can be hard sometimes figuring out what that is, but having a general idea at least, but then setting out and saying, okay, at this point I need to choose what I'm going to do. And then I'm going to document it and I'm going to figure out what, how I'm going to measure whether I'm having success with that. Right. So if it's, if it's direct mail, how many letters are you sending to what list? How many times? What are each one of those letters going to say? You don't have to get crazy and and do what I did and and buy this old direct mail, direct response book that was like this big and cost like $300 and then write all these really weird letters. 
<laughs> like one of the letters actually was like written, written from the perspective of a mouse or something. I don't know. It was weird. It was, it was really weird, but I was like, these are going to get responded to. But, but then you realize that, you know, mostly at the end of the day, people just want to like get a letter from somebody that's real and not just like BS in them. And so, you know, just saying, Hey, I'm an investor. I'm looking for a property in your area. I bought several. What I do is I fix them up and rent them out or sell them. And I'm, I feel like your property could be a candidate. So if you're interested, you know, give me a call, you know, just something where you're not like beating around the bush. You're not trying to be like, say that you're doing something else. You're just doing that. But, but then sending those like that campaign out, tracking what happens, tracking all the results. How many calls did you get? How many people wanted to be removed from the list? How many had the, the uh, equity to where you could go and make an offer on the house? And then how many of those did you actually make offers on? And then, you know, looking at that and saying, okay, we're going to do this again. And I'm going to see if those numbers change. Right. And once you start doing that, you're going to start seeing, okay, now we're generating a good amount of leads. Okay. But how come we're not getting deals? What part is happening at the next step? Right. We go on an appointment. They're just completely unmotivated or they're, you know, they don't have any equity. And, uh, and then, so you got to look at, okay, well, maybe the lead source is not a good one. We're generating a lot of leads, but if, if we're, we can't ever, you know, if they're never going to buy or, or sell, then, you know, maybe we're, we're may- wasting a lot of time. You know, we're going to all these appointments, we're handling all these calls, we're doing all this marketing, like we, we need to do something else. And, and so, so maybe do something else, maybe you do bandit signs or something. And, you know, you do it legally, illegally, whatever, you know, your area, sometimes it's illegal. But you put bandit signs out. Then you start getting calls. We're getting good leads. We're getting a good number of leads. Okay, so so the number of signs we're putting out, how we're putting them out is good. We're getting appointments, and they're motivated. Okay, we're putting offers in, but they're not taking them. We know they're motivated. We know they have equity. So now we need to look at what's our what's our acquisitions process. Is it that our that we as as a, an investor or somebody on our team as an acquisitions person? Do they need sales training to better close, right? So then you kind of like, you're really fine tuning your business. You're tweaking everything. And the reason why this became so important was, um, you know, before this call, I told you about, you know, the book that I wrote, Flipping Houses Exposed, where I documented 34 weeks in my business. And I generated 495 motivated seller leads during that time. But the issue wasn't the number of leads. The issue was how many deals I did. I did 11 deals from that, which really stinks. I mean, 11 deals is awesome. Don't get me wrong. Like, you know, doing 11 flips is is good money, but 495 leads is not really good. That's not a good conversion rate at all. At all. It's like 45 leads it takes for every one deal, right? That gets costly when you're spending $100, $200 or whatever per lead and trying to generate, you know, that many. So it was looking at, okay, well, what's, why was there only 11 deals? And we had actually gone from that to, and doing it ourselves, right? That was, that was the, the work harder, trying to have more success. And all it was doing was burning me out. And then we weren't having as much success. I was just being busier. I didn't have time for anything. And um, we went from that to building a team, hiring people, building a team, and then getting to the point where there were times where we were doing like one out of every five or one out of every seven leads became a deal. Right. And then we had time. I had time to, to work on software. I had time to do other things. And it's like, well, why did I wait so long? Why did I wait eight or nine years then to to do that? Right. Yeah, for sure. I mean, I mean, I'm, I'm just curious. How do you go from one out of 45 to one out of five just by hiring more team members? Because I feel like, you know, the motivations are going to change. Right. Just because you have more team members doesn't mean that you're going to have sellers who are more willing to sell. Yeah. So, so how, and that's, it's interesting because the, whenever I was, that was my biggest thing for not hiring people. That was my excuse that I would tell friends that, that had done that, had, had grown a business and then got themselves out of doing all the day to day in the business. You know, I was saying, well, I don't know that I would be able to get anybody that could go to these appointments and care about the business and really put them under contract. I just didn't believe that anybody would you know, it's like if the, if I had somebody that could do that, why wouldn't they do it themselves? Like, why would they want to work for me and do that and see what make money I'm making on these deals? 
So I had this like these beliefs that just weren't true that I was holding on to and keeping me from even trying it. You know, and so finally, like after getting over that and hiring somebody and then training them and then watching them do it, the difference is I was doing it and I was pretty good at it. I wasn't the best, but I was I was OK. Uh, but I had a bunch of other responsibilities. So situations like me taking a call and acting frustrated, that doesn't help your chances of getting a deal, does it? Right. You know, and so having. Um, somebody else that that's their job, that's their focus. They can go over there and they can sit down on the couch and talk with the seller for two hours and not stress because they don't have a bunch of other work to have to go and do, right? They don't have to go get the marketing out for the next round of leads. Um, They can sit there and they can take the time to build the rapport. And so they were closing more deals. We were getting more deals. I mean, it was just because we, we can't do everything ourselves. Hmm. What are some of the what are some of the key team members that you decide to hire first that really help you scale your business to the next level? Well, the biggest one at first was acquisitions because even driving across town to an appointment and then being there and then going to another one like that. So it was acquisitions was was really the first role that was filled. Then it was a lead manager after that. So to take calls, start taking all those calls. And if you're kind of slow, you can have acquisitions people take calls at first too. And I think maybe we did that for a little bit. And then we hired out a lead intake when we had enough lead coming in, which would also, they would also do follow-up. You know, if, they, if you're not getting enough calls to be full a full busy uh, person. And then, you know, dispositions, when you start doing a lot more wholesaling, get dispositions and uh, transaction coordinator kind of thing. So how big is your team now? The team now is actually just me again. Oh, <laughs> yeah. why don't you tell well, us the whole path? Like, how did you go from you know just you guys to building a team now back to just you? Yeah, yeah, the whole path. So we we built that team up. It was doing great, and at, at a certain point, I was focusing more because I was only in the the meeting every week at that point. After a while, right? That didn't happen overnight. That was a couple of years of growing that team. So just to give perspective. Um, and then it got to the point where I was only in the meetings and then they were saying, you know what? You don't even have to be in the meetings. It's like, if you don't want to, like we got this. And, and so my ex-wife actually took over handling all of that because there wasn't really all that much to do uh, from, from the management part of it. And because there was even one of the, the acquisitions people we moved up into sort of like a COO, like, a, you know, he was managing everybody on the team. And so I, I got to focus on the software because I had been doing that side by side for a long time. And it was really stressing me out because I'm in two worlds. And so I started focusing on, I got the time to do the software. And from there, uh, what happened and why I say I don't have a team anymore is because actually, two, like, what was it? Well, I guess it was just a year and a half ago. I, we got divorced. And so she went with the, the, the company, the house company, and then I stayed with the software company. But I do still invest, and that's why I still have my website, and that's where I get leads. And so my focus now is just doing rental properties, like looking for long-term rentals, so, so stuff that comes in, which is a good time to do that. Yeah. Sorry to hear about your divorce. Um, I know, yeah. like, how – I mean, I, when you have a significant other that works with you, you can build something really amazing. Like, I'm working with my girlfriend right now, so it's, it's really cool to, like, do projects together and whatnot. So let's talk about your software. Like, what are you working on, and how does it differ from the real estate investing side? Yeah, it's interesting because I learned so much from the, I feel like I'm having to relearn a lot of the things. And that's why I like talking about it as far as like getting over trying to do everything yourself. You know, you know, it's, it's funny how we still fall into that sometimes, but we, I've got a great team and this, this is a the software. We had created a version. It was called flip pilot and it basically did everything. Like we had an inbuilt, like a, a built in dialer that you could transfer calls to other team members on their browser and all kinds of stuff. And it just did everything for everybody and was built for big teams and all kinds of stuff. But it was too much. It was just like too many features that the usability of it was difficult. And um, and so we decided it was so hard to my team actually came to me. My, my development team came to me. and was like, hey, uh, we don't think that this is sustainable. It was like because because the whole back end actually was built by this like really expert programmer in Houston. who was very expensive. But the problem was like nobody on the team got along with him. 
And it was like, this isn't good. I mean, we can't like, and, he, and everything's hinging on him. If he goes, what are we going to do? Right? Like we could hire somebody to help figure it out. But it was just like, it was, it was kind of a powder keg. And it was like, we have to walk away from this. We have to rebuild and, and transition people to the, to a new one. And so we did that. And, and in that came the opportunity and believe me, that was not an easy decision because I'd already spent over a million dollars building that one. You know, so it was like, and we didn't like we got we got some people in it, but it was like this is we're not real happy with the way it came out. And so we actually made the decision to shut it down because it wasn't about just we could have like marketed the heck out of it, and got a bunch of people in there, but we wouldn't have been ever happy about it. It wasn't it wasn't what it, I wanted it to be. And so when we scrapped it, we said let's let's throw away all assumptions about what everything needs to be in here. Because if you look at what you're competing against, you might say, well, they've got all these features. We need to have all those features. That's not true because a lot of those features aren't even really necessary. And after being in this business so long, it took me a little while to figure out even why I needed software. Like what was the purpose of this in the beginning? Because it's become confused. The purpose is to make sure that you have organization of your leads and are doing follow-up. Right. Like you, that's really the basis of having that system. I mean, you don't, you can, you can try to put all this prospecting stuff in it and all these bells and whistles, but at the end of the day, it just has to do a really, really, really good job of making sure that you know what's happening with all of your leads and that nothing is slipping through the cracks. Nothing's being forgotten. Nothing is just like being let to to die off and let somebody else buy it five months later, you know, because you didn't do anything after that. And so that's what the system is all about. And so it's like, if that's what it's all about, why can't we just build something that's really easy to use and does it really, really, really well, right? And I'm not saying not powerful. It's got to be powerful. But like make it super visual. Make it something um, that, okay, so here's the thing, right? Whenever you, Sean, whenever you buy software, when you, you sign up for some new software, what do you do? Do you log in and start messing with it or do you watch videos for, for a whole week and then try to use it? Um, honestly, I do watch the videos. Um, I try <laughs> yeah, to understand. Well, I, I try to understand like what I'm getting myself into just because yeah. I don't like putting in my information right away. You know what I'm saying? Creating all these different login accounts aren't the best. But I understand sometimes I go in and, and test things out as well. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, so just having something that that's really kind of intuitive and and not all over the place. Um, the the cool thing that that I think that we really also excelled at was was coming from a place of um, not making assumptions about how something should work. So a CRM typically is like a list, right, of of your leads, and then you've got to mentally figure out what's where, what are the statuses, all that kind of stuff. Was we created like a Trello style, pipe drive style Kanban board where you can drag and drop and your workflow is visual because as something comes in and then goes to appointment set content, like negotiating under contract, all that kind of stuff, you can see where it's at. And um, one of the big things that we wanted to make sure that we did was as you're working any of those leads, if, if you're in it and you're working on it and you close it, you don't have to go back to some list, find out where you were and then go to the next one or, you know, that whole thing. So as you're looking at this and you click and open it up and then you close it, you're still right where you were, right? As you do anything in the system, like you're, you're never going in five clicks deep and then having to come back out and then go five clicks deep in against something else as you're doing the work. You know, we found a way to where you click once you do the work, you close it, you're right where you were, you do the next one. And then, you know, it's kind of hard to explain, I guess, but. Is your software live right now? Like people can go in and join it? Yeah, yeah. it's Forefront CRM. Okay, Forefront CRM.com. Very nice. Yeah. And uh, is it mostly uh, catered towards the real estate investor community? Oh, yeah. That's what it's mainly for. Yeah, that's uh, that's who the initial, all the defaults are for that. So you have a default follow-up sequences that are geared towards motivated sellers. So there'll be one for, you know, if they're motivated, if they're kind of motivated, if they're not motivated, you know, so it has different messaging with different sequences, and you can customize it all. But but it is built for uh, real estate investors. When you say different messaging, is it like an automatic uh, automated text that gets sent out, or automated email that gets sent out every like x weeks after your initial right. contact? Yep. 
Yep. Okay. So text, uh, emails, and then tasks get created for you or your team, whoever you have it assigned to. So if you want to, because you should, you should throw in manual calls to follow up. And um, so you can do all of that. And we've really focused on on making the automation not seem automated. Yeah. Right. Because to the seller, I think you're doing damage if you're sending stuff that seems automated. I think it doesn't, you know, it's spam, right? You feel like it's spam. Yeah. And so what we did was we created um, like in those messages, you can use short codes so that you can put like their name or their property address and different stuff in the sequence. So no matter which lead you put into that sequence, it's going to put that different information in the messages. You know, sometimes I find the best follow up message is just, how's it going? It's just really short yes. and simple. And they think, oh, this like guy's that. actually thinking of me. You can say to thousands of people, they think, oh my goodness, this one guy is thinking of me, right? So they usually reply back. I like that's yeah that's that and that's how they should be. I think all of them should be something like that. Yeah. Hey, did you ever sell that house? Yeah. You know, or what did you do with it? You know, it's like just something that, you know, is a, is a question, so they have a reason to respond, right? Not, hey, we still want to buy your house, and we'll give you cash. Like, you know, that's just spam. Yeah, exactly. You don't want to send them like a whole Mailchimp flyer with all the designs and stuff too, because they're like, mm-hmm. oh, this is just a, a newsletter. I don't want to see this. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So actually, I wanted to go back to your, I guess, your initial source of lead gen, which is your your um, your website. And you said that you ranked it. And that's why you have so many inbound leads going forward. Like, what did you do differently compared to all the other thousands of investor care websites out there that just have the same stuff? It's like an intake form for, I want to buy your house. What makes your site different? Yeah, so, in, in, and they actually teach the same thing, but... Um, it's it's really all about personalizing it, right? The website, like who's behind the website? Whenever I go to an investor website and I don't see anybody and I don't see a name anywhere, I, I really, you know, they do look the same and it's kind of hard to tell. I think the ones that have success are really the ones that show you who you are with a picture that doesn't look like completely super professional and stock photo-y. And you you have a picture with you and your dog or something or or even you with the seller, right? Like, just something somebody took from their phone, a picture on there, and then having those testimonials and the videos, but really just being it about like showing that personality in it, you know, in the website is it's really what makes it stand out. And then as far as ranking it, it's really just a matter of, uh, yeah, I'm a big fan of content marketing. It takes time, but that's a big reason why it works well because most people aren't willing to do it. And so doing content marketing, which is blog posts, you know, with related subjects and topics of why people might want to sell. So I did a ton of, of articles, blog posts about like um, inheriting houses, probate process, um, you know, like property taxes, what happens when property taxes are back due, co-compliance issues, all that kind of stuff. And, and the cool thing about all of that, and then like like rental properties, like how to sell a rental property. A lot of people inherit properties, become landlords that never intended to be. And so, you know, th- there's people searching for weird stuff sometimes. And what happens is you like the, the main keywords are stuff like sell house fast. We buy houses. Those are still, you know, cash for houses. Those are like the main ones where they know they're looking for an investor. Right. Those were great. Everybody's trying to rank for those, though. So if you're a new site and you're trying to rank for those, good luck. It's just going to take a while, a long while. You can do it. But what you should focus is on stuff that nobody else is really focusing on, those other ones like probate and all that kind of stuff. And the beautiful thing about when you create all those blog posts with those subjects is each one of those keywords that might be found inside of those blog posts, like how to sell a probate house or something or how to go through probate, you you don't get a whole lot of searches and a lot of traffic from each one of those. But the combination of all those keywords and all that kind of stuff together generates enough traffic to where you start to really get leads and deals. Yeah, so and, I've been doing YouTube for two years now, and my top video is how hard money loans work. And I made this before I was even a hard money lender. So it's just like a, a super niche video that like no one's really talking about. And yeah. also like the other day, like we're in the process of buying a flip project over in Texas. This one has like a lot of mold all over the walls, right? So we're looking into mold remediation and like understanding how mold remediation is done in Texas. Um, mm. Of course, that's led us to some very valuable content, some amazing websites. And of course, we're, they're going to be the first people we call because they seem like professionals. We're learning yeah. about how mold works 
through their website. So we're probably going to do business with them. Yeah. And then like, that's another one too, right? Put that on your house buying website blog because people that have mold are looking for, how do you deal with this? And they're like, man, Oh really? I have to do all that. I don't want to deal with that. I'd rather get a cash offer. That's right. <laughs> you know what I mean? And it's just like, that, that's how that works. Yeah. That's beautiful. Yeah. So yeah, that's, that's how that, how the website was kind of different and, and focused on ranking it. You know, the question I had too is back before you left your job, I mean, you were doing this for three years, which is a pretty long time. How were you able to take calls while you're still working a full-time job? That was the hard part. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, I, I mean, I don't, I hate saying it, but I mean, I wasn't supposed to have my phone. <laughs> <laughs> So it would be on vibrate or something, and I would have to run out into the stairwell and try to hop on it real quick if they're still calling. But if not, I would call them back immediately. So it was really answering my phone. Like I had to answer the phone. And so if it was at work, then it would have to be that way. I'd have to run out to the stairwell and, and take the call, like try to or return it. Yeah. And um, let me see what else. So I, everything that I did was at lunch and, and evenings and weekends. It's like I would go lunch breaks. I would take lunch breaks. And I would eat in my truck. As I go, I went and checked on rehabs and stuff like that. And then I have to come back. And appointments would be the same thing. I'd either have to do it at lunchtime or I'd have to do it, um, you know, in the evening on weekends, which yeah. was tricky sometimes, but we made it work. I remember having the same issue. Like my office, like my cubicle was in an area that was like a cell phone dead zone. So it was really hard to get reception. Whenever I thought my phone go off, I had to like run out into the hallway, right? Because you can't talk in the hallway. Everyone can hear you. You got to run out yeah. the hallway outside and then pick up the phone and talk to them. And of course, because you're doing like direct mail marketing, it is kind of like cold outreach. A lot of people, when they call you back, are cussing you out, right? So it, it wasn't always a pleasant experience for me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I mean, it's really smart to do the website thing. I, I definitely might try it out myself, especially in the near future. Because um, I mean, right now we're, we're trying to work with agents and just trying to you know, take their deals flow. And, and go from there. Have you had any experience doing that, like working with agents for their off-market listings? No, I mean a little bit where we had relationships, but but yeah, it's not not something I've ever really worked. Yeah, so direct. I mean, I guess direct mail is better because or ta contacting the sellers directly is better because you can get right into the meat of it, and you have to go through a third-party person. Mm -hmm. Yeah, can you give me like, an example of a deal you've done recently? A deal I did recently. I I bought a house that was. It's probably about four months ago or something. I bought a house that was kind of a hoarder house. It was a couple, an older couple, and they just had everything everywhere. And they were wanting to move to like Tennessee or somewhere where their son lived. And so their whole thing was, we don't want to have to clean this house out and sell it. You know, so it was, so whenever I told them. You take what you want and just leave the rest. Don't don't worry about anything. I'll take care of it. Like um, you know, we'll we'll get a big roll off, a couple roll off dumpsters and all that kind of stuff. So I bought that house and um, I was waiting on my contractor to finish another job to go to that one. And I was at a coffee shop and a guy was sitting next to me and he turned to me and goes, "Do you have a house that you want to sell?" And I was like, "What?" And he said, "Actually, as a matter of fact, I do. Uh, if you want to buy it, it needs a lot of work." And so it, it was a wholesaler and this guy was smart because like, he's just asking everybody. And it's like, I, I never thought, I mean, I, I maybe thought a little bit about it, but I didn't, I, you know, go after it. And then, so he, he asked, I said, well, yeah, go check it out, man. Just go drive by, check it out. Tell me what you think. And, uh, ended up wholesaling that to him for, I think 50 grand without having to, to do any work on it. That's amazing. Yeah. And then he sold it, he wholesaled it to another end flipper. Yeah. Uh, Wow. Yeah. So it shows my, maybe I got a really good deal on him better than I thought, I guess. But <laughs> <laughs> now when you were first getting started, what was your strategy to find good contractors to work on your jobs? The good contractors, that's a really good question because this, this business is hell when you don't have a good contractor. Like rehabbing is complete hell. I never, I didn't want to do it. I wanted to quit. I wanted to do other things every time. And and it wasn't because of the business. It was because of the contractor that I had. And it's like, sometimes you just like, yeah, that, that can like, so realize that if you're working with one that's horrible, it, it doesn't mean all of them are. But what I like 
most to find a new one is to when when you're driving for dollars you look for a rehab that's happening you stop in you ask to go inside and look at it they're going to think that you're with the city maybe so <laughs> you have to give them a card so they don't freak out um and think you're co-compliance or something but uh and because the cool thing is you can see how you just you just came to their job site right they were not prepared for you right how are things operating are they keeping it somewhat clean are there beer cans everywhere? Are they drink it on the job, all that kind of stuff. And then, you know, talk to how friendly is that that guy that you just interrupted on his work? And uh, and so that was my always my, my favorite way because you can get an idea of how the job is going. Going, do they have a lot of guys that are working? Are they all working pretty well? Um, and in my big thing, and this isn't something that everybody does. I, I know a lot of people that go the other route and find a GC to manage the subs. But I like to get the guy that is the that manages his subs, but also works on the jobs with them. That's always been the ones that I work best with, because you're not paying the overhead of the the GC that's driving around in a big truck all day and just managing crews. He's working the job too. He's getting a cut out of the the job itself. So they're generally not working for a bunch of different people doing a bunch of rehabs at once. It's a guy that's doing the stuff, and he's got a couple helpers. And those are typically the ones that I've had the best luck with. And whenever I find a good one, we end up, you know, getting to know each other pretty well, working really well together. And it ends up being like a five to 10 year thing, you yeah. know? And so it's really cool. You know, when, when you're working with one, that's not like that. And that's why I like them too, because, you know, sometimes the guys that are trying to do a bunch of stuff, their relationships with a bunch of people and it's kind of hard to, you know, really have that close relationship where like this guy knows that I'm going to feed him a bunch of jobs and he's going to, he's going to really do well and really want to make it always work and make it easy for me. Right. Cause the contractor we have now, I love the guy. He's awesome. He's been working for us for at least 10 years, I think. And, um, he, he will, will do stuff that wasn't on the scope and then not even say anything about it and not ask for extra money or nothing. Just like, it's just a part of it. And you found him also on a job site? You just randomly went to his job site to find him? I think so. And he was working for another uh, investor in town. And he still does some stuff for that guy's rentals. But that guy wasn't as active anymore. And so he he just started doing a lot of our our jobs and started working for us. Nice. Awesome. So I also know you're also the host of the Flipping Junkies podcast. Do you want to talk a little bit about your podcast show, why you started it, and some of the key insights you've learned from all the guests you've had on? Yeah, flipping junkie is uh it's more for for a newer audience looking to get into real estate investing and um I guess insights as far as you know people the guests being on there. I think the thing for for that podcast for me and I'm still doing it, we still do the the flipping junkie podcast was that I got to a point where I felt like the interviews were a little bit disconnected, right? You listen to one topic one week and then the next week it become something completely different. And I said, that's okay, you know, for entertainment purposes. But when you're trying to learn the business and being that this podcast is focused on, you know, a newer investor trying to make it in the business, what if I structured every episode in order of what needed to be done, almost like an audio course, right? Where if you went back and listened, it was like listening to a course with a bunch of different people, experts along the way in each different step. So around episode 16, I think it was, I started doing just that. Like I had episodes about, you know, motivation, foundation, mindset, getting your mind right about becoming, you know, going into business, being an entrepreneur and then setting goals. And then, you know, marketing is next and what to do, how to take the calls, appointments, all that stuff. And I think I went like 50 episodes like doing orderly. So it all kind of made sense. And then I went back to interviews because it was too hard. There was like, <laughs> like, where do you go from there? Like, it, but so that that's, yeah. I mean, that's the insight I got from that. I did start a new podcast called uh, Braver. It's called okay. Braver. And it, it doesn't say real estate or flipping in the title, but it is obviously about real estate investing. And uh, it, it's more, that one is more geared towards investors that are already doing deals that are already at least marketing, getting leads in. And being in that spot, like I was in for too many years, doing everything myself. So that that podcast is geared to those people. And obviously new people can get a bunch of information from that. But really what I, 
and, and who it's for is, is people in that spot and looking at the reason why it's called braver is because it's, it's voluntarily looking at why you are not making tr the transition to hiring people and getting out of the way for your success so that you can have real freedom. Um, and that's why it's called braver. But the, uh, the, the interesting thing was, and, and it just came to me just now about how I was in the past and doing everything myself. I had a belief that in running this business by myself and with my ex-wife that we could stop and go for a three month vacation. Right. And we wouldn't have any concerns. We wouldn't have any responsibility for keeping anything going because we didn't have any employees. Right. Which was complete bogus. Like there, well, we never took that vacation, three month vacation. We never could because we were too busy having to keep it all going. You know, so I had this idea that by doing this, by not having bringing on this responsibility, I have more freedom. And really, in hindsight, I that took away my freedom. Because I had to keep everything going. And uh, so that that's it's like so. Yeah, I, don't know, I say that because if anybody else out there is like maybe thinking you know, if I hire people, I'm bringing the responsibility on and I have like, I'm giving up a bigger piece of I'm giving up a piece of the pie, all that kind of stuff. Um, look at that, like be honest with yourself and look at whether that's really the truth. I just interviewed somebody recently who said, um, I didn't want to hire anybody because I didn't want to give up a piece of the pie. The pie was already small enough. I wasn't making that much. And he said, after he got a, a acquisitions person that next year, he quadrupled his revenue. Like, what does that tell you? Like, yeah, somebody's getting a piece of the pie, but you just got a lot bigger pie. Yep. I mean, that's not always the case, obviously, but that's that's just what's possible. It's pretty exciting. Yeah. Would you say this is kind of the reason why you're focusing more towards the rental properties, just because it does give you that freedom? You don't have to always be active on the on the job site, and always find that next big deal? You're talking about the rentals? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The, well, I mean, honestly, though, the it's like during the divorce, it's like kind of looking at the splitting up assets and everything. And multiple companies it was it was difficult but but the realization was wow most of the wealth here most of the net worth is from the the notes that we did and the rentals just from holding it right yeah over time yeah yeah i mean it's just like whoa why did why wasn't this the focus <laughs> like, i mean <laughs> like i mean obviously with with appreciation being so good and, and inflation likely coming i mean it just makes sense to to have real estate for long term yeah, absolutely. Um, you know, Danny, I've had an amazing time having you on the show today and talking about your journey of, you know, buying thousands of properties over your, um, you know, long real estate investing career. I'm excited to go on your show to talk about hard money loans and about especially our long term rental loan program, because you do have a 30 year fixed program for investors who can just get. Nice. Yeah, for like four or five percent. So it's like it's gonna be really good. I'm excited to talk to you about that later. But yeah, Danny, thank you again so much for your time. How can people find out more about you? Yeah, the the best place would be um, to, I used to tell people a bunch of different stuff, but if you really want to uh, find out more, I guess check out the, the Braver podcast. It's braver.fm is the website and just look up Braver uh, Danny Johnson on uh, podcast or whatever. But if anybody wants to reach out, uh, you can email me at danny at forefrontcrm.com, danny at forefrontcrm.com. Yeah, and if everyone needs a great CRM software, check out Forefront CRM as well. Thanks, man. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Danny, thank you again so much for your time on the show. And I'm definitely looking forward to speaking with you very soon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Thanks, Sean. I hope you enjoyed this episode. You can find the show notes and other episodes on our site, everythingrei.com slash podcast. If you live in the Bay Area, join our meetup group, where we meet up twice a month in San Jose at meetup.com slash everythingrei. And if you thought this was a great episode, let me know what your key takeaway was and share it with a friend who's interested in real estate investing. Thanks and have a great day. This was another episode of the Everything Real Estate Investing Show with Sean Pan. If you enjoyed the show, leave us a five-star rating. It will only take a second and it'll help a lot. You can contact me at sean at everythingrei.com. That's S-E-A-N at everythingrei.com. Thanks and have a great day.